Affect Autism, where Affect is the number one tool we use in supporting child development through playful interactions. Welcome back, listeners. I'm Daria Brown, and this week we have a returning guest, Stephanie Peters, and a new guest, Courtney St. Germain. Both are occupational therapists who are expert DIR floor time training leaders at the Interdisciplinary Council on Development and Learning's DIR Institute, or the Developmental Individual Differences Relationship-Based Model DIR Floor Time Institute in Livingston, New Jersey, where Courtney is the program director. And we are here this week to discuss their continuing ed article that was published in AOTA in January, the American Occupational Therapy Association's OT magazine, entitled, Combining DIR Floor Time and Sensory Integration for Children with ASD, or Autism Spectrum Disorder. And it really focuses on um, sensory modulation and promoting social-emotional development by combining DIR floor time and sensory integration treatment, which is what we discussed with Keith Lander last week. So I thought, what a great follow-up to that. Um, Welcome, ladies. Hello. Thank Thank you. you. Why don't you describe, summarize maybe the article and then focus in on a few pieces that you want to focus on? Um, Courtney, what what was your thinking when you guys collaborated? Like, let's do a paper about this because. So interestingly enough, being an OT first, right? We are writing for the Occupational Therapy Association. So it was hard, I think, in the beginning to separate our DIR floor time framework from because we do it so intuitively and it's just part of our practice we really had to write from a lens that OTs may have never heard of DIR floor time so we had to write it in a way that was digestible but yet relatable and infusing that sensory integration piece was I think the focus because from an from the AOTA perspective they wanted to know how would DIR really support the sensory integration. So as we got into the research, interestingly enough, we were finding that all of the sensor, sensory integration research is showing improvement in all these different performance areas, except for this emotional reactivity. And, and as we were combing through, I was like, oh my goodness, what if DIR really could be this missing link to what sensory integration is already doing because it's play-based, it's fun. We're, we're, we're looking for those adaptive behaviors. Um, but yet again, I could be doing this great treatment, but not attuning to those emotional responses. And DIR really does that quite nicely. Um, so I think that was one of the differences from, for, for us, it was hard to kind of rein in. If we weren't DIR people, would we understand the content that we're, we're writing? And unfortunately, we've seen many OTs respond to emotional reactivity or emotion, any emotion within a session from a very different perspective, where if a child is fearful or unhappy or scared, um, the, the tendency is to push through it or force the interaction with whatever sensory um, piece is causing that response with with the idea of this child needs to get used to it they need to experience it they need to learn to cope with it um and uh, and it causes a fracture in the relationship it causes often more anxiety um and i'm guilty of this too it's been one of my learning curves throughout my practice and i think we all have because the culture is if you don't like something like that really stinks but you still have to do it and this is the world we live in so i think the balance with floor time is, is the permission or the ability to stop in that moment and engage with that emotion and see where it can take us. Um, and that was something I think we both felt was really important as an underlying message we wanted to share with other occupational therapists, that there was another way of, of doing this really valuable work that can transcend your practice and get stronger and better outcomes for, for the child and family. And I do, there's this, this pressure to, to work on therapeutic goals and, and to be showing that you're actually making progress. And sometimes when we're using these techniques that are more DIR, you know, we're attuning, we're being those pauses in therapy, we can feel the pressure of, oh, I'm not doing enough. So this is a really great foundation 
but to say, no, there's value in this pause. There's value in sitting in this icky moment of emotional dysregulation. And we'll get back to that, you know, play-based sensory integration treatment that we, we can hang on to. My hope anyway, for, for the other OTs were they would leave with this essence of there, this is okay. There is something else. There is something more to this sensory integration framework that, that we can use and build on. So Stephanie, last week, Keith and I really discussed that emotional component of sensory integration that you can't do sensory integration without co-regulation and um, taking into account a child's emotional regulation. And so um, was this the basis of where you guys were starting your article from, or was it sort of a piece of the article? I think it's a, it was a big piece of the article because as occupational therapists and floor timers, we're duly aware of the fact that, as Courtney says, there's an emotional tag to every sensation that's um, palpable when you're working with somebody with sensory modulation differences. So a child will bring to an interaction an emotional response to sensory input. And as floor timers, who where our focus is supporting Um, social emotional development is how do we respond to that emotion um, and and really see it as an opportunity for co-regulation to enhance engagement and then continue upward development on the developmental ladder. And you guys really focused on the early functional emotional developmental capacities in the DIR model, didn't you? Which is the regulation, the engagement and shared attention and back and forth interactions. Um, Did you focus on that, those three in particular, because that's where you see the regulation challenges and in early intervention or? I think, I think that, well, A, we had a word limit. So we probably could have gone on for (laughs) way too many pages than someone had the time to sit and read. But I think it comes back to the idea that when we're working with anybody, we want to support the foundation. We want to have a strong foundation before we build up and off of it. Um, Whenever we're engaging with anybody, it always comes back to the first three capacities. Um, We want to luxuriate them in them, as I heard someone reference yesterday, we want to, we want to spend time in them and just get all of the goodness out of it. Um, And in reality, emotions come in every capacity and how we respond to them within the first three really sets the stage for how much we can build off of it in the later ones and how many more connections we can build off of them um, and how complex we can make them. But if we're not strong in the beginning, we can't really get there. I, I love what both of you guys said because it really corroborates exactly what Keith was speaking about last week about how important it is to acknowledge Uh, what the children are feeling and experiencing and how important it is to maintain that trust between you guys and the client. Because if you break that trust and you're just pushing them through, you're going to lose, you lose a lot of power that you have in those playful interactions. I was wondering if we could elaborate then, how does that look like, Stephanie, how does it look like when a child gets stuck in that moment when they express that emotion and, you know, 90% of the world will say, oh, they have to get used to it and push them through it. What is it that's different Mm -hmm. with floor time? I think it comes back to the heart that, that we want children to be intrinsically curious and interested in interacting with the people in their environment and their Um, sensory environment. We want it to come from a place of desire, not an imposed um, request or demand. And, And if for anybody, if you have a big feeling about something and someone tells you to get over it, or it's not that bad, or it's not that big of a deal, it usually, especially as an adult, um, results in the opposite reaction of, you can't tell me that, I feel horrible about this, and it's my experience, and this is what I think about it, and I can't move on from this before I've processed my emotion. Um, and in floor time, we have the, the gift of having that um, emotion be in a shared capacity in a relationship with someone to co-regulate with you 
to, um, to set that space of like, oh, wow, this is really hard or you don't really like this, or this is really scary, or no way do you want to do this. Okay, I hear you. And then once you can hold somebody in that space, all of a sudden, regulation improves, we de-escalate the situation, someone's more emotionally available to logically think through, wait a minute, okay, they heard me, now what do I do? And really think about that next step. Um, so I'd say step one is recognize what you see and validate it. Validate, validate is a beautiful gift to give anybody, but especially within a practice when you have your goal and everybody's watching you, wanting you to get there, to be able to say, this comes first and this will help us get there. But this is the most important thing that maybe we could possibly do for the whole session. And did you have anything to add as well, Courtney? Yeah, I, I would say that the, the sense, first and foremost, sensory modulation is one component of sensory processing. And it was something that we felt we needed to specifically focus in on because it really sets the foundation for the rest of sensory processing. So if you're. Can, can you define sensory modulation? So sensory modulation is, is, our, is our brain's way of perceiving the threshold, the amount of that sensory input, how much of an auditory stimulus can I process? We all have a typical threshold, but for some of our kids that we work with, we like to think about it as a cup. Their cups are teeny tiny, and it doesn't take as much of, in, of that input to make them feel overwhelmed. So ideally, we want our cups to be full, but not overflowing. And then for our kids who maybe have really, really large cups, we see it all the time with our proprioceptive systems. Kids need a lot of jumping, a lot of crashing. Their cups might be really large. So it takes more of that input to feel like they're in this just right place and they're able to organize their body and integrate all of those sensations. So each system has its own cup and then how that gets integrated is more of that um, sensory modulation piece. Um, and then how do, I, how do I perceive that input? So I'm okay with tags, right? On the back of our clothing, I'm okay with tactile input, but for some of our kids, that's a real challenge. So I think this is where empathy really comes in and has a huge value because I don't have to understand from a physical standpoint what that might be feeling like. But from a perception standpoint, I can certainly empathize with a child who is struggling, meet them where they are, acknowledge it, validate, like Stephanie said, validate their experience. And then thinking more broadly, in a sensory integration treatment, we have all these lovely swings, right? Dynamic services, they're fun and exciting. And then what happens as soon as that child tries to get onto the swing and we see this like almost fear response, right? Being able to acknowledge that that's a fear response, understand, let's see, is it, is it the swing's texture? Is it the visual? Is it too high? Is it the fear of, is, how is it going to move? So we can accommodate some of those sensitivities and, and not push through and try to get that adaptive response, but really support and attune to what we're seeing so that we can help facilitate and get to that bigger goal of being on some type of dynamic equipment so that we do get that adaptive response that we're looking for in a more traditional um, sensory integration treatment. And I'm just curious if you're trying to stay in a moment as Stephanie described when that child expresses something and you're acknowledging like, oh, looks scary. Oh, I wonder how it's going to move. And you're sort of guessing and commenting. What if the child is really clearly uncomfortable and sitting in that uncomfortable moment and distracts you away from that uncomfortable moment? How do you guys handle that? It, it comes back to the FEDCs and the thinking from the DAR floor time lens of it doesn't matter. What matters is thinking about which functional, emotional, developmental capacity we're on and letting that be your guide. So if a child is upset, 
and we're thinking about, okay, capacity one, regulation is something that we need to be thinking about. What, what do I need to do to co-regulate? Do I need to validate? Do I need to stop the swing and hold that space of, ooh, that didn't feel so good. And then once we do that and we have engagement, because all of a sudden we've co-regulated, the child is attending to us and they feel connected and maybe they're still a little bit upset or maybe still kind of sad, but we're in that space together. And then maybe we can get to capacity three. We're having back and forth exchanges of recognizing that um, with affect. Oh, and they have the same expression on their face and we can go back and forth with that emotional response. Once we have that strong foundation, then maybe we can go to capacity four with what do we do now? Do we get off? Do we try again? Do we totally throw the swing away like where do we go from there but it's child-led and child-directed and it comes from that dar floor time lens where it just kind of almost happens naturally because asi air sensory integration treatment is child-led but we have to consider that's the sensory modulation piece is only one part of the star institute's nosology for sensory processing if a child is uncomfortable in a certain posture or a certain position, that is another piece of sensory processing, which all links back to the sensory modulation. So if a child is struggling to integrate all of those sensations at the same time, and we're seeing either a fear response or more escalated fight response, or even just like slouchy, um, you know, just more fatigue, not a, not a great, whatever the, the activity is, we can understand as OTs that that postural control is being impacted by their ability to modulate those senses. So impacts the other, which impacts the other. Mm -hmm. And I think that was part of the reason why we also chose to write about the sensory modulation piece, because it truly is the foundation for both floor time and sensory processing disorder. So the more we can attune to those sensory modulation differences, the more we can support those postural pieces, the more we can support the developmental capacities. And, and I just love how it all, it honestly just integrates for us from a practice standpoint, DIR floor time really is for, for me, I, I'm a little biased, but it's, it's the way to all of this information that is still meaningful to the child. We're still following the child's lead and they find joy, we find joy and, and we get lost in the play as much as, as they are. And that's when you know it's working when parents are like, wait a minute, you guys are having a lot of fun here. <laughs> and, and those adaptive responses are happening as a result because we have attuned relationships, but we're also getting the sensory integration that we're, the parents are coming in for as a treatment. What I love about that, Courtney, is it, it is such a stark difference to the relationship consequences and the, the therapeutic consequences. And as a clinician, what you're missing out, if you see it more behaviorally as they're being difficult or they don't want to do it, because then you end up forcing it, which which causes a disconnect between you and the child. But also as a therapist, you lose the ability to, to think, wait a minute, what about their sensory processing? What else on that continuum of sensory processing might be impacting their ability to do this? It's not a choice. It's an emotional response that is indicating something else is going on that it's my job to be aware of so that I can support it and not the, the solution isn't to force the interaction with that sensory experience. It's to think about all of the pieces that are coming together, educate the family and help to make that connection for the family and the child of like, oh, this is really scary because your body doesn't feel safe. And then why doesn't it feel safe? And then everything kind of makes a lot more sense, whether it's thinking about discrimination or posture and praxis and all of those pieces that really make up the whole picture. What's discrimination? <laughs> it's your ability to um, interpret the sensory information through space and time, like 
the, a classic example is if your eyes are closed, your proprioceptive discrimination allows you to touch your nose without your, eye, your visual system helping your sense of body awareness. And it, there are examples for all of the sensory systems. But if you don't have an understanding of that first modulation piece, um, it's going to impact all of the other things that come after it, because that's really the root of sensory processing is your ability to interpret the intensity of a sensory experience. Another example would be within the tactile system. So if I am having these, maybe I'm not allowing for touch and because it's, it's an overwhelming sensory experience, I'm not, I'm losing out on experiences that are going to help me refine my discrimination through touch. So I'm not going to, maybe I'm avoiding grass or I'm avoiding dirt or I'm avoiding fleece, whatever the, the texture may be, I'm not going to have those experiences to build upon. So it's impacting that, that tactile or the sensory discrimination. And that can happen for any of the sensory systems. That's so interesting. Um, a couple of points. To me, it's a bit comical that everybody doesn't go to occupational therapists because we all have something along those lines, like some sensory thing that bothers us, but it's never, ever addressed. But when you have a child on the spectrum who's seeing an OT, everything is addressed. So you're putting them through this huge scrutiny of what their experiences are that neurotypical people never put themselves through unless an issue comes up of some kind or an injury or whatever. So I think that's interesting and a bit comical. I think it's comical as well, because we, we, we have the privilege of being neurotypical. Um, and I have sensory challenges. I've taken the, the sensory self-assessment. It comes out as typical performance in all of those areas. But I know that from an auditory standpoint, I can get very overwhelmed if I'm stressed, if I'm tired, if I'm, I'm not feeling well. So understand those vulnerabilities within each sensory system and how I react, right? It's that emotional response to, oof, it's really, really loud in here. And can I stay regulated enough to ask a family member to turn off the TV or to be quiet? Or do I have my own skills where I can get up and walk away and put, put myself in a different room and make that accommodation for myself? Or do I just explode? And do I have a moment of rage? If we're being honest, I've had all three. It just depends on the severity. And, and again, your ability to regulate in the moment, to modulate those, those inputs, that sensation. And I think as we, we continue to talk, I'm hoping that it will really normalize some of the sensory modulation difficulties because it's not specific to kids with ASD. I think it truly is, we're, we're sensory beings. Like that is how we experience the world acknowledging that some days are going to be better than others. Some moments are going to be better than others, but we, we want to be able to integrate all of that input at the same time. So we know that children with ASD have more difficulty as the environment gets a little more complex, that it can be harder to, to keep that integration going and still have emotional regulation. Um, so again, whether it's families listening to the podcast, other OTs listening to the podcast, other professionals, understanding this sensory modulation piece really is the foundation to get your child to engagement, that, that second FEDC too. So we, we want them to have an attunement, right? So again, I don't need to know firsthand what it's like to have an itchy tag on my back. As long as I'm empathizing, I can validate that experience. I can change. I, I can use some different floor time techniques to have that attunement. And then we can go into more engagement and work on those higher capacities. And that's, for me, that's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. And, and it, like in terms of the foundation, like you can't get there until you have understood and connected over what what the linchpin issue is. For so many parents that are just starting the, the, their floor time journey, it's what's happening? What's causing this dysregulation? It's a mystery and it's confusing and it's really scary. But with the, the OT sensory processing 
lens plus the floor time together, we're able to really look at what's happening and understand and appreciate which sensory system is contributing to dysregulation because of modulation difficulties. And once we can, we can identify, then we can connect with it. Um, and then you can do something about it. But until then, it's, it's a disconnection and it's a mystery and it's really stressful. It's so powerful to have that. It, it, even for adults, if, if you're having an experience of, I'm just so upset and I have no idea why, it's a horrible feeling. Um, but with a close relationship that can say, oh, you're really hungry and the TV's on too loud and it's late at night. Let me turn the TV down and get you a snack. And all of a sudden you have that engagement in that relationship and you can have a nice evening. That's my personal example, but um, it really transcends your age and your, if you're neurotypical or neurodiverse, it's, it's about being human and it connects us all. One, one thing that you said, Stephanie, I think a few moments back was about behavior. And I think what this offers is a way to kind of reframe what those behaviors mean and what that intent is and see it as a form of communication. And we as, o as OTs are going a little bit deeper and figuring out like what sensory system is really causing that barrier or the, the dysregulation. But at the end of the day, if we see it as communication and we respond to it in a way where we're again attuning and we're not getting frustrated and and saying, oh, they're just being defiant. We can, I think it softens us too, right? We, we can stay regulated enough to problem solve and to think, okay, if I were them and empathize, if I were them, what would I need right now? And, and that process, that relationship piece, I think is so invaluable. And, and I don't want to speak from a, a general sense and, and, maybe it's the wrong assumption, but how often, especially in COVID, how many times are you having attuned moments throughout your day, even as adults? And, and we have a gift to give to our kids. And I think through that process, um, hopefully we as therapists, we as adults, we as parents can, can learn the value of, oof, this feels really good. And, and instead of having a power struggle, you can you can work through that together and, and work on those higher capacities, which we didn't touch the article because it would have been probably a thousand or a hundred thousand words. And we had like a 50,000 word limit. Um, so to be continued, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, that leads into the other question I was going to ask, which is about parents. So what if the parents really struggle with, taking that empathetic side because it might just be so inconvenient to the lifestyle that they lead or whatever. Like every time this happens, my child just freaks out and I can't accommodate every time. And, and, you know, parents are on their own journey. Um, you know, they're going to, some parents are going to be overwhelmingly accommodating and other parents are, are going to have less patience with certain types of things. How do you work with parents to really get them on board with that emotional piece? Because that a lot of parents aren't comfortable sitting in that emotional spot themselves necessarily, while others are, but the ones that aren't maybe, how do you sort of get them in to see that side of things and how helpful it will be? I, I love the, the analogy of it's really hard to teach a child to blow their nose when they have the flu. It's really hard to practice these strategies in the really big moments. That's the ultimate goal is that it'll help improve connection and reduce dysregulation and severity in the big moments. But when there are small moments and you're feeling regulated too, your regulation as an adult is just as important. In giving yourself the, the ability or the permission that those are great times to practice validation or empathy of you are so excited this is making you so happy. Maybe starting off with an easier positive emotion to validate and connect with. Um, that will help you be more open to when it's starting to feel a little more uncomfortable. And I, I like to always say, um, you know, use comments over questions because it's, 
you know, you hear it all the time when you visit relatives or whatever, it, it's question, 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 question to our children. So, oh, what's wrong? What are you feeling? Tell mama, you know, and, and in that moment, they can't. So just commenting, oh, it looks like something's really hard. Hmm, I wonder what's happening. Oh, like that kind of thing. You know, acknowledging for parents, this is hard. This is, this is tough stuff. And, you know, if you've had seven years of experience of meltdowns and tantrums and you're trying with everything that you have inside of you to console your child, yeah, I, eventually you're going to have these moments where you snap. And I think that's just human. And again, normalizing some of those experiences for parents because this this regulation, the sensory modulation piece is for everybody. It's for all of us. And, and then saying in that moment, you were not able to regulate your own self. Who around you, what relationships do you have could offer some of that co-regulation for yourself? And now on top of that, we have this pandemic, which I think we're seeing just even the parents that we're working with, things are a little bit more challenging given the circumstances. So it was tough before and it's even harder now. So for me, that empathizing with parents first and then trying to show them some type of ob- observation, whether it's a video review of, oh, I think, you know, your child had this moment of meltdown or, or tantrum. I'm wondering what what was the almost like body language before this meltdown? What was the cue that we could have picked up on for next time? You know, we're not going to catch it every single moment, but next time, what could we try to observe to try to, to anticipate that that's where they're going? They're, they're not going to be able to modulate if one more thing gets added to their cup. And, and I think that process talking through and, allowing parents to connect those dots has really um, unlocked conversation and reflection and, you know, parents kind of removing the guilt of I've tried everything and I, you know, I feel awful that I can't, can't make this connection or whatever it is. So it's really supporting meeting the, not only meeting the child where they're at, but meeting the parents where they're at and, and, The model works for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. And um, I'd like to take the last bit of our podcast today to sort of extend what you're talking about in your article to application. So (laughs) I'm going to put you guys on the spot. Listeners, I did not ask this question in advance, so they are completely (laughs) unprepared. But um, of course, I always use my son as an example. So he has pretty, I would say, um, maybe not extreme, but can be extreme sensory integration um, challenges that he's been working on. And uh, I'm wondering how you would apply this type of work to a classroom situation. So he's in a very small classroom. There's five kids. There's a teacher, but there's also TAs, helpers in the room. So um, lots of support. And his latest thing that's been going on for months and months now that is just not stopping. And because we were on lockdown and now they're back, it's ramping up again, is this upregulation and calling friends Mario Kart names. So I'm going to use the generic name, Johnny. Johnny, you're Bowser. Ha 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 ha. So-and-so, you're Princess Peach. So-and-so, you're Daisy. Ha 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 ha. And... While we all understand that he's not trying to be a little disturber, (laughs) um, he's not trying to be a bad boy or or say anything like that. He's somehow experimenting with something. When when he gets up regulated, it just starts and it's very disruptive for the class. And some of the kids are really sensitive to that. And, hey, he called me so-and-so. I'm angry, blah, 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 blah. So um, just from what, I listened to today, I have some takeaways and some guesses, like perhaps he's getting really restless in his seat because his core needs to be supported. Perhaps he 
is bored waiting while all the kids are working on something and maybe he finishes first. He's one of the older kids of the group because his he's developmentally behind. So the kids are quite a few years younger than him. So maybe he finishes a couple of things a little bit more quickly and he's waiting. And so what do I do with that wait time? But I'll put it to you guys. <laughs> I think you answered a little bit of your own question, Daria. But I, I, I love the 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 difference between the having the pressure to fix and solve versus creating the space to wonder. Um, and there's again so much pressure to do something about it, especially if other children are becoming upset and are affected, because you don't really have the luxury of sitting back and think, I wonder which modulation system is underlying this experience for him. So it's kind of that balance of um, in the moment, you, and I know you've, I'm cheating a little bit because I've heard you speak of this example a little bit, but of honoring, oh, look at Sarah's face, she looks so sad and helping to bridge that connection. But then um, afterwards, if you're self-reflecting, doing exactly what you just did of like, hmm, what, 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 what was he communicating? And then why? Something wasn't right. And I wonder what that could have been. Um, you do that naturally, but I, I, I presume that's along the lines of the, what your thought process was. And I was also thinking of, you know, because they're doing that and, and it does seem to be helping bringing the perspective of the other child, like, oh no, he looks so angry. He didn't like that. But it doesn't seem to be um, changing the behavior necessarily. Although no, he I is don't. able to say, I feel like calling my friends names sometimes before it happens and then they can intervene. But um, I was thinking like maybe just focusing, trying to keep him in that zone. Like, mm -hmm. oh, something's hard for you. Oh, I wonder yeah. what's going on for you as opposed to just focusing on the other, mm -hmm. keeping him in that moment with himself as well. As I, well I, as commenting, like you could also comment on the other two, like both for sure. I would definitely, I, I think that's heading in the right direction. Cause I, as you were explaining your example, I was thinking, wow, he must really love Mario Kart. There, <laughs> there has to be some emotional, like the fact that he's using that as a means of his own regulation, I think one is a huge strength mm -hmm. that he has that strategy. Um, and, and bringing it to another child and making that focus of like, oh, look at them, they're sad, they're crying, you call them a name. It's um, that, that empathy piece is so high up on the developmental capacities. And I love that having those experiences, but the, the root of it, right? You've identified that it's his own sensory modulation. So if he's regulating and we're starting to see him, him call his friends different names, that's our clue of, okay, something, something is going on here. Is it his posture? Does he need to get up and move around? Does he need another activity because this waiting period just boredom and it's hard to wait? Um, or you could also see it as a way of, of connecting with the other kids. So if that is an emotional experience for him that he loves cart, the fact that he wants to share it with others, again, making that connection is a little bit bigger, but there are a lot of different ways I think you could kind of dissect and use the floor time aspects of the model to, to really dig into his behavior, his disruptive behavior. Um, but I, I, I like that you're thinking about how, how is his body, what is his body telling us in that moment? And from a modulation standpoint, you know, the more people that are in the room, the busier it is, the more noises you have, the more things you filter and from a sensory perspective, that's complex. That's really, it can be overwhelming. Um, so it might be even just kind of closing off from, and, and one treatment technique I think as an OT that I can offer is when somebody is escalating or kind of bubbling over, we need to do, we need to provide less. So less sound, less visual, less movement. It's counter it's counterintuitive in a lot of ways because we're, we're trying to like fix it and 
and figure out. But even that expression of, oh, look at that child's face. Like now he has to look. So there's more visual. We're listening. So there's more auditory input. And what is that doing to his body? Is that offering regulation to have that conversation? For some kids, sure. For some kids, that would, you know, totally make them escalate even further. So figuring out, do we need to do less in that moment to support him? Or does he, in fact, really do need that conversation? He needs more um, to re-regulate. Because at the end of the day, it's about engagement. (laughs) If we're not connecting with other kids, or other people in a way that's meaningful to, to both parties. It, it sh- ultimately should be shared. So he's offering this experience to another child, but they're having a negative experience. So, you know, we want it to be a shared, joyful experience. And to me, it's more about he's dysregulated in that moment. I hope that yeah, yeah. And, and I think you run the risk of it um, being a routine. So, oh, look at how mm-hmm. that feelings. So and so is angry. And, you know, and then every day, so and so is angry without processing, like, what does that feel like that that person's angry in that? My last question, which we'll do really quick because we're running out of time, um, is how do you then pull him from the room? Because he does have breaks where he goes with his main therapist to his own little room and do mm-hmm. regulation activities and, you know, roll a weighted ball, that type of thing to calm down and then returns. But how do you do that exit without it being like, you were a bad boy, you're punished, yeah, which they don't say. Yeah. Um, how do you smoothly say, Oh, we need a break. Let's go to our room or whatever. I would highlight the detail and what they're seeing. So oh, I noticed your body's getting a little more wiggly. You need a break. And connecting that body with with the emotion of maybe you're bored, maybe you're frustrated, maybe, um, maybe you just you're really excited. Want, maybe you just really want to play with your friends yeah. so bad and playing yeah. is so much fun. And I can't yeah. wait till we finish this math exercise or whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. It requires initial self-reflection. So in the moment when it's happening, you have some ideas to try and you have some wonderings of, is it coming from a place of praxis? Does he know what he should be doing next? Because then we need to help support with an idea. Is it coming from a place of decreased postural control and fatigue? In which case we know he might need a break or we know that we need to limit the time that he has to sit in advance so he doesn't get to that point. So really informing the why behind the what so that we can swoop in with a strategy that we have a hypothesis of like, this is what's going on and this is what he's communicating. I think the other, the part that you're describing too is what we call in the OT world, more of a sensory based um, intervention, which is more of a sensory diet. And that is typically adult directed. And what we're really looking for in DIR and more of a traditional sensory integration perspective for that child to really own whatever that regulation strategy is. So I think it's connecting the dots of what's going on in his body and then ultimately offering, you know, do you need to move or do you need to do this so that there's some ownership of that process Um, and yes, you're giving two options. So it might feel adult directed, but that those options should come from a place where you know the child, you know what he likes, you know what he needs. It's not this blanket of, I have this sensory technique, this sensory technique, this sensory technique, and we're just going to do one of them because you're wiggly. It's, It's really knowing the why behind all of that. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I think parents will find this really rewarding and a great compliment to the podcast with Keith Lander last week. If you haven't heard that, go back to affectautism.com and search co-regulation is the driver of sensory integration. That was last week's podcast. Um, Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Courtney. It was great having you guys on. And If anyone loved hearing this feedback, be sure to check out affectautism.com for the blog post. I'll put links to a lot of the stuff that came up today, as well as to the DIR Institute and DIR's home program, where both of these lovely ladies can support you and your family virtually if you um, are in the home program or in person at the DIR Institute in Livington, New Jersey. So I'll put links to that as well. Thank you guys so much. 
Thank you so much. If you're a caregiver looking to implement your own floor time approach, please check the ICDL parent website at the Interdisciplinary Council on Development and Learning for virtual floor time consultation or for the weekly parent support meetings. We aim to help you implement your program at home using the Developmental Individual Differences Relationship-Based Model, or DIR, taking into account your child's developmental level, their individual differences, and using your relationship with them to help promote and support their development. Until next time, here's to affecting autism through playful interactions.